So welcome, welcome. My name is Mary Hess. I want to say something about the fact that this is a collaborative session, um, which is designed differently from the regular paper sessions or the plenaries. It's a session that's expanded space and time for participation, for learning in more experiential ways. So today we're going to start with Tyler and then around the hour mark, we're going to take a brief stretch break and then we'll move to Alyssa and Anna who will also have close to an hour to work with us. Um, so just so you know up front, <laughs> that's kind of how we're gonna do this. Um, I also wanna ask us all to take a moment to ground ourselves in this space. So take a nice deep breath in and let it out. Feel your feet or your seat, wherever you're sitting or standing. Um, grounding in this space. I happen to serve on the faculty of Luther Seminary in St. Paul, so I'm going to share with you what our land acknowledgement is. This is something the faculty came up with, and while I'm doing that, I would invite you to put your name, your pronouns if you wish, um, if you know whose land you're on, to put that in the chat as well um, as we start. So in my case, Luther Seminary is on Minnesota Makoche, which is the homelands of the Dakota Oyate, the Ojibwe, Ho-Chunk, Cheyenne, Oto, Iowa, and the Sac and Fox also inhabited Minnesota land. And we, that is Luther Seminary, uh, faculty recognize that God calls all to be in right relationship with their neighbors, that the tribes are sovereign nations, that there's a history of broken treaties and broken trust, and that there's much reconciling work to be done. Luther's a Christian institution, so as Christians, we also recognize that in Christ there's new life, forgiveness, and hope for mending what is broken, and we pray the Holy Spirit will lead us in this work. Um, and now, let me introduce Tyler to you. Reverend Tyler Sitt is the founding pastor of New City Church here, a church in Minneapolis that's led mostly by queer people of color. New City became the first built from scratch church plant to charter in Minnesota United Methodism in decades. And in 2022, New City launched its second branch, Northeast United Methodist Church. Sit is a second generation Chinese American and he focuses his racial justice work into Intersect, a church planting network that he co-founded during the pandemic. He has been featured in the New York Times, the Atlantic, Minnesota Public Radio and more. And I welcome you, Tyler to this space. Hello, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be joining all of you. I am uh, truly honored to be in this space. So thank you, thank you. Um, to, can we show some Zoom claps for the REA folks who are pulling together so much of this? Hello, thank you. And a special call out to Dory Baker who invited me to this. So grateful for that. So today I'm going uh, to first present and then Anna and Alyssa are gonna present after this and then we'll have some Q and A afterwards, just like Mary had said, Dr. Hess had said. So I, um, but I also want it to be participatory. So if you have questions, um, feel free to write that in the chat. I'm also aware that there is at least one watch part. Is that right? There was like a group of people watching. So if you all, uh, if you all, uh, need to go off mic to just shout it out or whatever, then I'm also open to that. Um, great. So I'm going to share my screen and um, could all of you just give me a thumbs up when you see it? Bless the Lord. Listen, half of the, half of the presentation is just this. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the practical exploration of the role of engaging nature in faith communities, support of BIPOC community members, healing from racialized trauma. Um, I'm going to be speaking from my experience planting New City Church in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. But, um, I, you know, all of you are experts in this, in your own lives, in your own context, and in your own fields. And so I also welcome um, any type of feedback or interaction or anything that you want to put in the chat. Um, also, this is the <laughs> a little confession. This is the first time that I'm presenting using this platform or this tool because I, I wanted to, um, I had an idea while I was scheming and dreaming with Dory in, in Washington, D.C. about creating a presentation that's a little bit more participatory. So we're going to give it a shot. Um, so we have already done introductions, but um, I just want to 
uh, name again that I'm a, a Chinese American here in uh, traditional Dakota land. And I planted New City Church in 2017. Um, and New City is a community, you know, we, uh, we're we in the Powderhorn neighborhood. Um, so we're in the Powderhorn neighborhood um, of Minneapolis. And we are, this is like a robustly diverse neighborhood. So we're looking at like um, equal parts within the neighborhood, uh, white, black, indigenous, and um, and then like a slower representation of Asians <laughs> like me. And, um, and then within the black population, there's a bifurcation of African-Americans, uh, Somali, folks from Somalia, folks from Ethiopia, and then Latin A are the main populations in my neighborhood. Um, so just given the topic of this REA and given uh, the time that we have together, could you all just put in the chat or shout out, what are barriers that BIPOC folk in, in experience in engaging nature or having access to nature? What are things in, in your experience? And so you can either go off mute or you can put it in the chat. And then once you put it in the chat, I'll uh, write a post-it note for it as well. What do you find? Yeah. So like right away, uh, there's some systemic things of like, if nature means going far away to a place that's in control by like a resort or like a private industry, then right away that there's, um, there's cost. Um, there's feeling safe and welcome. Yep. Um, uh, natural spaces often being in or near segregated areas. Yeah, so these are all really good. <laughs> White supremacy in general. I knew I liked you. Uh, that, <laughs> that's great. Yeah, uh, lack of lack of wild space. This is oops. Here we go. Um, so and then ge generational trauma. Yeah. So, like as you're looking at these. I just want to name that, and I uh, appreciate that there are answers that continue to come into the chat. Um, just naming that, like, it's not accidental that many different BIPOC communities have a ruptured relationship with the planet. Um, it's it's um, the byproduct, and in some ways, the the weapon of oppression used against BIPOC communities. Um, to have access to health, to have access to flourishing, and um, and ultimately coming from a place where in my community, like nature is seen as um, like a, a leisure activity, an expensive leisure activity. So just naming that like a lot of times in broader America, when we're talking about getting out in nature, we're talking about leaving a place to go to another place, which is usually never set up for BIPOC people and experiencing something distant from uh, far away. And that is certainly something that I experienced um, as a Chinese American and growing up uh, with my dad um, telling story. My dad grew up in government housing in Hong Kong. He lived in basically a concrete box his whole life and then came to the United States. And uh, we lived in a place that didn't have a lot of access, immediate access to nature. And as uh, he economically developed, that was when he started bringing us outside more. And that's ultimately what created kind of the seeds of my own environmental orientation. So I think um, I bring this up to name that um, when we're talking about creating an anti-racist movement, we also have to consider how nature and the planet are all interwoven into that, as well as how climate change justice and climate liberation is a deeply anti-racist topic and consideration. Like these are so deeply intertwined. Um, and so because of this, when I planted a church uh, in, New uh, in New City in 2015, we started the Backyard Farm Project the Backyard Farm Project was, so this is like um, an urban agriculture project where we had, we brought free 
uh, fruit trees to people's yards. Um, and it was, if we just put those fruit trees into a wagon, knocked uh, up and down the street, said, do you want a fruit tree? And they're like, sure, or no, or get off of my yard. <laughs> and uh, and then we would plant, um, like uh, raise your hand if you're familiar with permaculture. Like we would plant, um, yeah, like these, these like um, self-sustaining ecosystems in people's yards so that uh, nature wasn't the thing that you left home to experience expensively, but nature is something that you wake up to and go to sleep with. Like nature is just part of uh, who we are. And that was, that was the project. And we ran for, um, for six months or ran for uh, six planting seasons. And it was entirely successful by any nonprofit measure, like the number of families impacted, the uh, amount, the pounds of produce created, the number of uh, volunteer hours and FaceTime hours that we had with our neighborhood. By any nonprofit metric, it was a success. But one thing that was missing was that uh, there was no leadership from the neighborhood. So even still, we were experienced, we were, you know, planting these fruit trees in people's yards and people loved it, but none of the folks in the neighborhood were stepping up to lead backyard farms, even though it was such a positive experience. And, and uh, we asked why, and, uh, and we did this whole listening campaign, uh, asking people, like, if this is something that's so meaningful for you, like, what would it take or what would it look like for you to be leading this for your own neighbors? And what we heard again and again were stories of racialized trauma. Uh, stories of people who had uh, negative experiences with the police, uh, employment discrimination, immigration traumas, traumas from um, being a migrant population, and mainly hearing stories of like, I can't get out of bed in the morning some days. So why would I lead a new program? You know what I mean? Like it, there's this kind of sense of like my mental health is in a place where like sometimes I can't even function or get my kids to school. So why in the world would I like take on another thing as good as it is? So even though this program was successful and fundraising was successful and the metrics were successful, it was a non-negotiable for us that we had leadership from the neighborhood. And since that wasn't happening, and since racialized trauma was part of our neighborhood story, we folded the backyard farm program and turned it into da, 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 the incarnation fund. And um, so the incarnation fund supports BIPOC community members in accessing therapy, spiritual direction, and nature-based retreats led by BIPOC practitioners. So basically, um, you know, if what we learned from our, what we learned from our neighborhood is that people loved nature and they wanted to connect with trees and they wanted to connect with uh, berries and in, in their yard and the soil, but the mental health challenges of just making it through day by day were presenting a rupture to that relationship. So we felt like the way to um, change the paradigm would be first addressing mental health and approaching it from a trauma healing standpoint, and then approaching nature from that direction. And y'all, can I just tell you the energetic difference between like planting fruit trees in people's yards and inviting people into a, a year long therapy experience was completely different. It was amazing to witness. And so just uh, in case you're interested in starting your own incarnation fund, this is how we run it. Um, every September, uh, we kick off a new cohort of incarnation fund participants. We uh, have a very brief application process that just lets people know their story. Um, we have three retreats uh, in the fall, in the winter, and in the spring, because um, I don't know if you've ever been around Minnesota in the dead of winter, but sometimes winter can have a negative effect on people's mental health. I know this is going to blow your mind. 
I know, <laughs> but uh, having like eight months of snow on the ground can sometimes affect people's mental health. So part of it was like, hey, um, getting outdoors when it's negative 40 degrees is still part of your mental health. Like this is not something that we get to choose. And it's funny because I'm watching all of the faces on this, on um, in this group and like all these people in warm areas are cringing. And I just want to be clear that like right now it's 70 degrees in Minneapolis and lovely. And all of you are melting in your 112 degree, like nightmare firehouse. Okay. I'm just, I'm just saying. So, okay. Uh, back to the, the program design. So we have, um, we break people into, squads of three people so as people go to um go to therapy and by the way they uh participants select their own therapist that's a key thing um and so as people are engaging therapy they're also like sending video messages to each other just checking in like how are you doing what is your spiritual direction talking about like what do you need to be able to stay on track and support each other um, and it's, and it's all, uh, it's all free. We pay for, uh, 25 therapy sessions, 10 spiritual direction sessions and three retreats. And like, if that sounds expensive, it is, <laughs> but what we're learning again and again is that the health impacts are immeasurably deeper than anything we've done before. Like just the, it's an expensive program in terms of paying for so much, but it's the very cheapest way that we could arrive at the type of impact that we're seeing. Like people in tears coming to new cities saying, I'm finally able to reclaim my life again. Like I've finally been able to break out of the cycles of trauma that my family and I have been so plagued by. Um, so that's the overview of the Incarnation Fund. Just as a quick pause, any questions or clarifications until uh, this point? Give me a thumbs up if you feel like you are grasping what the Incarnation Fund is about and our story. Okay. Yeah, 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 great. Um, and by the way, this is run by, so this is run by a church. This is not like a separate nonprofit. This is like a ministry of the church. And we do not, oh, does the room have, I feel like Wanda's room is about to crack up. Yeah. Uh, um, Dory says in the chat, the Incarnation Fund is an example of innovating religious education through a lens of climate justice, addressing what Danielle Four spoke about yesterday, suggesting make the concerns often more marginalized people with your own. Yeah, 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 yeah. And this is like run, I mean, the director of the Incarnation Fund, Krista, is someone who is an alum of the Incarnation Fund. So like right away off the bat, we have um, like a us healing us mentality instead of this like outside uh, uh, toxic charity thing where it's like, all of the solutions are outside of our community. And now we need those handouts in order to make like none of that stuff. Krista uh, went through the Incarnation Fund and, and is leading it now. And uh, all of these materials are passed through people who have uh, gone through it. Okay. Tyler, so, the, question, the yeah. question from the regional meeting was to describe the retreats. Yes. So uh, the retreats are... Um, so we do three different, um, so we have the fall retreat, the winter retreat, and the spring retreat, spring summer retreat. So uh, each of these have different learning goals. So the activities are different, but um, the fall retreat, and by the way, is w Wanda's room, are you all, give me a thumbs up. Are you all okay seeing these poster notes? Are you just like so sad? No, you're okay. Yay. Okay. So many thumbs up. So the fall retreat is like um, building, the goal is building base relationships uh, between each other. Because what we found again and again is that the number one variable of whether or not someone successfully completes the incarnation fund year is if they have relationships with people within the incarnation fund. So um, we uh, uh, do a base building, uh, like relationship building kind of thing. This is hosted in um, 
this is usually hosted in like a further out nature spot. So like a, um, a Springwell retreat center or, or a place where it's like, it kind of feels like an exciting beginning to something like, wow, something's really starting. Um, we distribute like credit cards, church in uh, We use in uh, church cards for people to then put on file with their therapist. And so there's also like um, a lot of naming, like how New City manages trust. And just like, yeah, we have, we give participants cards and then we have a portal for them to upload their receipts. And then we say like, this is what happens if you don't upload this many receipts over this much time. Um, and and kind of how we negotiate that. The winter retreat, yeah, and burst cards are sweet. Um, the winter retreat, the focus is a lot more on like befriending winter, uh, which is, I know, for all of you in warm climates, it's it's hard to grasp what's going on. But like our community has um, so much seasonal affective disorder that like it it's a real like it's a real public health concern. So a lot of the focus is like how can we not think of winter as something to escape from, but as a season where different types of activities happen. And the larger learning, of course, is like hey, just like there are certain activities in summer and certain activities in winter, your life is going to go through certain activities where sometimes you'll be in a lament place and sometimes you'll be in a joyful place and we roll with all of that. So we actually, this is real, we go um, cross country skiing in Minneapolis. And, and, and this is, so this is a Minneapolis uh, door. So there's like a whole cross country skiing uh, course in North Minneapolis, which is historically black, um, black and African American neighborhood, and and we're like, okay, we just have to get outside, and we're gonna talk about it, and it's gonna be a fun experience. We can do this, and um, I'll talk about it a little bit later in the presentation. But this is often one of the most surprising um, retreats because people are so challenged to befriend the winter, um, and then the spring summer one is uh, usually like a closing. And so that happens at the Humanity Center in St. Paul. So it's a little bit more elevated of a experience. Like there's like catered food and that kind of thing. And um, and this is also open to alum. So anyone who graduated from the incarnation funds can participate in that. Okay. Uh, uh, Wanda's room, did that? Give me a thumbs up if that's getting at what you're trying to go at. Yes, yes, yes. Love the enthusiastic. Listen. You can't just give a thumbs up like this. Fully extended arms, that's what we're in it for. Okay, love, okay. The other question in the chat was, da, 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 how do people join the cohorts? Yeah, so we have our application process that's uh, in every, like we open it every August and then uh, we spread it out to all of our networks and then people apply. And we've had people from outside of Minneapolis. We've actually experimented with people outside of Minnesota and seeing whether or not that that works or not. Um, but it's it's usually word of mouth and networks and advertising. Does that get at what you're going asking, Cassidy? Gorgeous. Okay, let's keep going. Um, there are four findings. There's lots and lots and lots of stories that have come out of this. Um, stories of people's lives being changed, stories of people recruiting other friends to do this. But there are four outcomes that I want um, to especially emphasize. So one is just naming that like, when nature becomes a critical part of the healing journey, environmentalism comes easy. So just naming like, this is not a uh, this is not an explicitly environmental justice program. Like we don't we don't um, approach this like this is the incarnation fund for nature lovers. What we're saying is like nature is an inextricable part of healing any human body because we have evolved to be connected to plants and nature and weather and sky. And uh, so when we show like the connection to nature is not as like some external cause that we have to sign up for, but actually like an intrinsic part of how we become whole, like 
everyone becomes an environmentalist then. So like what people started talking about was like, wow, I'm going to start bringing my kids here or I'm going to start bringing my friends here um, or I'm going to make sure I do this every Sunday because this has been such an important spot for me. Or literally like just going down to a pond and seeing a mallard duck. And I just remember one participant saying um, that mallard duck isn't pretending to be anyone else but himself. That mallard duck is just being a duck. And that's what I want to be like. And I'm like, okay, so <laughs> like that's that's a different type of environmentalism. You know, like there, that's, that's an environmentalism of like, there is a, a biomimicry. Like there is a way that I can be like I see nature being and that helps me become whole. That is a totally different dimensional universe <laughs> from uh, all the environmental things that I was part of before. Like this, it's so, um, it's so personal and it's so tender and dear. Next, uh, one of our findings was uh, nature helps people oops, connect with each other. So just naming like uh, uh, conversations that happen outside tend to go better than the conversations that happen inside. So anytime that we can have squads or cohorts going for a walk, uh, meeting on a patio, opening a window, <laughs> like those are um, key times when like people are able to tap into that parasympathetic nervous system and be able to connect in a more meaningful way as long as um as long as nature is safe so like um we we also have stories of going to Potterhorn Park you no know, you know for example um one of our community members is a dancer and so they were going to an outdoor african dance class in Potterhorn Park and because it's a public space, one of um, anyone can walk by. And one of the white community members in Powderhorn came by and kind of like mocked the women or like mocked the dance and then left. And that participant never went back to that dance class after that moment. You know what I mean? So like uh, uh, there's something that registers in that story where it's like, she went to a bunch of dance classes and had a really positive experience and then had one particularly violent experience. And that meant that the park was uh, uh, no longer accessible to her. So part of this like work of, of nature being a, a place where people can connect with each other is creating a base level of trust and making sure that like some random white neighbor is not gonna stop by and mock the African dance group that's going on. You know, like that, that's part of like the container uh, creation. Um, next, uh, a key finding was um, nature teaches us how to heal ourselves. I kind of talked about this with the, the duck story, but um, there's been just been a number of times in the incarnation fund where people said, like, look at how this tree was planted in such a weird way and it's growing sideways. But then once it found a clearing to reach the light, it took a 90 degree turn and started reaching towards the light. Do you know the types of tree I'm, I'm the trees I'm talking about? Yeah, like look at how uh, these plants so persistently angled themselves to be able to find flourishing even when they weren't set up for success. Like I wonder if there's something there. Minnesota is on the migration pattern for monarch butterflies. And so like one of uh, the immigrants participating in um, the incarnation fund was like, wow, monarch butterflies what came from really far away places and they still find a way to make a home here. And they do it in community. So maybe I can also find community. Like there's this, um, there's this wisdom that naturally preaches itself, like nature just naturally preaches um, when, when we let people have that type of experience. And uh, lastly, uh, like this is a matter of, like nature is a matter of encountering God. 
So as a church, uh, a lot of people at New City love the music of New City. And if I were to ever go to church and say, we're no longer going to have music, people would be really mad at me because music is one of the ways that they encounter God. And what we're seeing over time with the Incarnation Fund is that nature is another one of those ways that people are encountering God. And if we take away nature, then that is just as like violent and unnatural as if we were to take away music from worship. So um, like letting people steer that themselves has been huge. By the way, uh, the Incarnation Fund does is does not, I should have put that here, um, does not have uh, no explicit Christian curriculum. Like we say, we ask people to find spiritual directors. Sometimes people find spiritual directors who aren't Christian. And we're like, great, we, we want you to be able to choose that because like healing comes when people can steer their own healing journey. And like just part of our theory of change is like, hey, uh, these folks need to be able to make decisions for what healing looks like. And that's, um, so that's where that come, came from. Um, and then I guess I would just have some final remarks and then I would love to hear, uh, we'll have, well, actually we'll do Q and A after uh, uh, Anna and Alyssa's presentation. So you'll have a little bit of time to meditate yourself and then uh, we'll save all the Q&A till after. Is that right, Dr. Hess? Well, I was going to say you haven't used up the whole hour. So if you want to do Q&A now, that's fine too. Okay. A cute little moment. And then we can, yeah. Okay. That's fun. Um, so um, the last thing I, I would say, I, I would say a couple of things. One, uh, we've launched something called Community Healing Projects. So Community Healing Projects are alum of the Incarnation Fund can pitch the healing project to New City Church. So um, kind of our, th our the theory of change is that um, uh, our healing isn't complete until we are part of healing our outer communities as well. Like, it's, it's one thing to go to therapy and it's another thing to transform the conditions that force you to need to have therapy. <laughs> so um, so community healing projects are just uh, ways for people to pitch different ideas of how they can go about healing communities. We, and what we find again and again is like, we don't, um, we don't require community healing projects to be nature-based but they keep on being nature-based. <laughs> like people just naturally come up with ideas uh, around this. And so for example, we had a um, a bike black tour where we did a, a bike tour of the historical sites of black Minneapolis. And like that was not pitched as an environmental program. But uh, because it was biking and it was getting people outdoors, it naturally became an environmental program. You know what I mean? Uh, we have Krista's launching a Montessori school for BIPOC folks. And uh, like they've had trouble finding a building for that Montessori school, not because there aren't buildings available, but because Krista refuses to launch this school in a building that doesn't have access to green space. Do you hear the learning that's going on right now? Like Krista from her own life, but also through the, uh, through the uh, incarnation fund now sees nature as so important that as a early childhood educator, she's unwilling to launch a school unless they have access to significant green space. Is it, uh, this is huge. It's blowing my mind. So, uh, and, and I praise God for all of that. Um, and lastly, I just want to name, I said this before, but like, like this is about us doing this for us. This isn't like those community members are doing that or like these practitioners are doing this. Like we continually and all, say like this is how we are going about our own healing journey and we get to decide what this looks like um and even as i'm fundraising for it and going out and asking donors for it like 
a lot of times people will want me to paint it in this picture of look at those poor black and brown people and how they don't have access to whatever. Let's help those poor people. And um, and I always categorically refuse that because that's not what has happened with the Incarnation Fund. What the Incarnation Fund has done is identified people who are already leaders in their neighborhood who are carrying 300 pounds of trauma that when you remove like 200 of those pounds of trauma, they can do amazing things that no one else can do in the neighborhood. And like, that's um, that's the theology of it all. Like that's the resurrection part for me. Okay, um, I do have some minutes. So I wanna pause and, uh, and hear any questions or thoughts. Um, I, I can always be telling stories because I just love this program so much, but are there any questions or thoughts or questions? Mm -hmm. And in fact, let's um let's go ahead and take 30. I should practice good pedagogy now that we're at REA. Let's take 30 seconds of silence for you to quietly reflect to yourself. And then we'll get into QA. So just 30 seconds of Okay, let's come on back. Um, fabulous, I see a hand, go, uh, go for it, Noel. Uh, yes, thanks for your presentation, it's very interesting and uh, informative. I'm, I'm curious, uh, as an academic, uh, and when you got to the point of findings of your uh, fund activities, uh, I can't help wondering, have you had either reached out or received inquiries from academics to uh, actually uh, undertake uh, an academic study of what has been done or simply try it out themselves. And uh, the particular fields of study that come to mind, of course, would be sociology, psychology, uh, education, uh, organization uh, geniuses and so on, that kind of thing. I'm, I'm just curious about that. Thanks for your question. Um, we have had several researchers study New City as a church, as a religious community. We haven't had sociologists come to study the mental health impacts of the Incarnation Fund. So if you have any cool friends, then <laughs> feel free to send them along the way uh what else yeah other other thoughts other questions or Tyler I'm curious have you had other people say I want to start an incarnation fund how would it look different in my neighborhood yeah um we have gotten that especially because, um, so part of the kind of discipleship, I'm gonna use that word, discipleship model, uh, a new city is um, uh, folks of color, generally almost 100% almost of the folks of color at new city have um, gone through the incarnation fund. And it's an expectation that if uh, the, that the white folks at new city are part of the funding of the incarnation fund. And so uh, Paula calls it a, um, a mental health reparation because uh, Minneapolis is a 60% white city. Minnesota is an 80% white state. So like just kind of the invisible tax of existing as a person of color um, is, has, I mean, there's lots of research about the mental health impacts that has on people. So anyways, um, uh, what we, we've found as other people are talking about starting an incarnation fund is starting to like get to know the contextual history of their places and why mental health burdens on BIPOC folk like are the way that they are in their their particular city or in their particular economic strata because uh Minneapolis is a very particular place I should have also mentioned like New City um is walking distance from George Floyd Square where the uprisings happened in 2020 and 
And we had been running the Incarnation Fund for three years before the uprisings, which as a person of faith, I'm like, okay, so God was like, you don't even know why you're going to need this, but I'm just going to make sure that you have this in, in place. Because uh, yeah, the Incarnation Fund got a lot of use uh, in 2020. But yeah, that's my main uh, my my main counsel, Dory, is for people to be able to tell a story of why this is the right intervention or program for their place with their relationships in their uh, their city. Yeah, Regina. Yes, uh, I am using my mom's uh, iPad, so don't don't uh, worry. My my name okay. is Ruby. Yes, Regina's uh, child. Hello. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, you're right. So, um, thank you for your presentation, and uh, it's fascinating um, to hear you talk about incarnation, fun city, new city. These are some of the concepts you use, and. Um, Abun, uh, my curiosity uh, is you tie this uh, to um, an outcome to heal mental health healing. I was wondering why is it so restrictive? And um, if we are doing religious education and uh, this is a model uh, tied to an outcome that seem to be prescriptive model and uh, how does that um, counteract uh, the outcomes that you are trying to address for instance um, we we are living in environments that are pre-programmed to generate these uh, mental health issues. And now we are seeking healing and uh, using the same model of philosophy, you know, to be prescriptive of the outcome. Did that question ever cross your mind that you are um, the restrictiveness might be a limitation to what you are trying to achieve? Thank yeah, you. And help me understand, you're saying restrictiveness around focusing only on mental health? Yes, it's, it's, yeah, it's instead pres of other types prescriptive of and that's restrictive and that's the limitation. Do you consider yes, that? Yes, yes, yes. Thought? Yeah, what great question. Um, so we, um, and this is also very contextual and very neighborhood based. Um, so in our neighborhood, there's the Alina Hospital Medical System. So, um, and there's a, a lot of nonprofits in Powderhorn. Like you can't really walk down the street without tripping over a community organizer or a nonprofit leader. <laughs> um, so there are avenues for people to pursue physical healing or medical healing. Um, and physical therapy in our neighborhood. However, for mental health specifically, all of the free and sliding scale clinics in our neighborhood are staffed by white therapists. So for someone and um, most of the therapists of color in the Twin Cities and in the United States are out of network. So for someone, for a BIPOC person to experience therapy from someone who looked like them it would be like hundreds of dollars more per year just because of being out of network for insurance so that was um yeah so we identified that as a particular gap in our neighborhood that people were really excited about because they had their other they had outlets for other types of healing but not this type of healing but i'm very pro physical and medical healing in general. <laughs> let the, okay. Let the okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Tyler, there's questions coming from the regional meeting that Wanda is hosting. What you got? What you got? Well, thank you. And I, we can hear your enthusiasm and you can feel ours for the work that you're doing. W question I have for you is, um, have you you've shown us lots of successes 
Can you tell us something that didn't go well that you've learned from? <laughs> oh yeah. How much time do you have? Uh, okay, okay. Pick one, pick one. Okay. Literally um, in the pilot year of this program, we, we picked a therapist and a spiritual director and said, all of the program participants have to go to these two practitioners for their journey. And the reason why we did that is because we wanted to make it an easy, we wanted to overcome the barrier of entry to therapy and say like, hey, we already found the therapist. All you need to do is find the time. That was a terrible idea yes. <laughs> because uh, if any of you are in therapy, you know, like the like patient client or the patient therapist relationship is so specific to your personality and to kind of what makes you unique that forcing everyone to see one particular one practitioner was uh, really disempowering for our participants. So actually we had those same participants. We said, sorry, we kind of messed this up. Why don't you come back a second year and we'll pay for whatever therapy you want with whoever you want. And it went a lot better after that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so many thumbs up. Yes, yeah. Um, the other thing I would say, just in terms of lessons learned, is um, uh, uh, our the our bodies are very good at survival, and that means that when something really scary or dramatic happens, our bodies have ways of putting that into a, a little sealed container so that we can get away and survive. But in the incarnation fund, as people are going through therapy they're unsealing the containers of where the scary things happened. And sometimes that brings out a lot of really, um, uh, it just feels really scary to all of a sudden have like all of this stuff, stuff coming up. So we've also had people say like, after one or two months, like this is actually too intense for me or like somehow I need to like be in a different part of my life to be able to do this. And that's, that also raises tons of practical questions of like, well, what does it mean for us to have communal healing if even like being on a mental health journey is not, you know, so um, that's been, that's been a huge learning curve as well. I am uh, really excited to introduce to you our next two speakers as well. So Ana del Castillo, a Mississippian and Peruvian Bolivian American is innovating at the intersection of justice, politics, and healing. Anna currently serves as the executive director of Our Own Deep Wells, a movement dedicated to adapting communal and individual soulful practices to build mental and emotional resilience. Anna served in the Biden-Harris administration as the Deputy Director of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility for the White House. She received her Master of Divinity as a Dean's Fellow at Harvard Divinity School, where she studied public policy, racial justice, and healing, leading the charge to create HDS's Climate Justice Week. While at HDS, Han Anna co-created Fire Salons, which you'll get a chance to do something with after this session, um, anyway, uh, for Circle Spaces for Processing Climate Grief, alongside writer-in-residence Terry Tempest-Williams. Anna dedicates her life to curating experiences for individual healing and collective action, believing that the combination of the two will lead to lasting social change. Alyssa Wilson is a recent undergraduate pursuing an MA in nonprofit leadership studies. Alyssa has a passion for community and civic engagement, believing that we can do nothing if we do not lean on each other. She works as a project assistant for Our Own Deep Wells, Awakening Spiritual Practices for Wellness, and has a deep love and belief in mindfulness practices for both the individual and the community. In her spare time, she enjoys crafting, gardening, and cooking new recipes. So Anna and Alyssa, the space is yours. So I'll start off by just thanking everyone for being here today. It's so awesome to see so many faces from, from all over. This is really, really cool to see so many people together. Um, as Mary said, 
my name is Alyssa Wilson. I'm the project assistant for our own deep wells. And today we're gonna, me and Anna are gonna be talking to you about this amazing collective that is working on awakening soulful practices for wellness. Um, I'm coming to you from Raleigh, North Carolina today. Um, and for um, visual um, purposes, I, I identify as a young woman in my 20s. Today I have my hair in a bun and wearing glasses and a brown sweater. So that's me. Wonderful. I'm so excited to be doing this with Alyssa and just want to say thank you so much, Tyler, for the wisdom and just like wisdom droppings that I'm still sitting with and I think are a perfect segue into our conversation now. But um, as Mary introduced so beautifully with um, with her introductions. My name is Ana del Castillo. I use she, her, her pronouns, and I'm calling in today from Washington, D.C. on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway people. I have long brown hair. I'm wearing um, glasses. I have tan skin, and I identify as a millennial person, and I'm so excited to be with you in the next 40 minutes or so as we dive into the power of tapping into our own deep wells to support our individual and communal healing as we face the climate catastrophe in front of us. So who we are, who is our own deep wells? We are an initiative that was created in 2022 to address the mental health epidemic facing young people, and not just young people, but all people. This was founded by practical theologian, Dr. Dory Baker, who I know is on the call right now. So sending some love to Dory, who has brought so many of us together, um, alongside her trusted friend um, and mental health professional, Nicholas Stephen George, and in a very Dory and Nick Fashion, their two-person team has expanded into this really beautiful collective of an intergener intergenerational collective of diverse folks from across religious and spiritual traditions who are curating resources to support young adult plus mental health and flourishing. And I'll get to that later, but we are supporting young adults plus all the folks who we've encountered in the last year and a half who also are um, seeking these resources and opportunities to talk about soulful practices. So here's just a lovely quote from our leadership team. Um, and I believe it was actually Dory who, who said this. Um, we're helping people, especially young people, awaken soulful practices already within tapping into our own deep wells of wisdom creates pathways for healing. So you might be thinking, why is it necessary that we tap into our own deep wells of wisdom to create these pathways? And as, as a, a collective, we see these three major sources of despair that are affecting not only young people, um, but intergenerationally, these, these things are affecting us. Um, so it's, that's social media overconsumption, social, social isolation due to the pandemic, but also coincides with that social media overconsumption and climate despair. And these are all structural injustices. We see how huge these things affect everyone on, on a large level, um, as well as on individual levels. And I, as, as Dr. Hess said, I'm a recent college graduate. And one of the reasons why I started working with our own deep wells um, in September of 2023 is because I, I see all three of these injustices in my in my peers with my friends and you can tell that there's just some I have some friends that just can't even get out of bed in the mornings um, and so that's one of the one of the big reasons why I've chosen to become involved with this amazing collective and at the beginning of June I had the opportunity to go to Oberlin Ohio and present um, on our own deep wells and lead a couple soulful practices with a group of Bonner leaders, if you've ever heard of the Bonner leader program. Um, and it was a really amazing experience to see these people come together. Bonner leaders are 
leaders in, in colleges who are engaged um, civically, and it's all about volunteer work and nonprofit work. And we had a discussion about how important it is to be connecting with nature and going outside and slowing down in order to take care of ourselves and to take care of our communities. Thank you so much, Alyssa, for providing a bit of the context of what brought you to our own deep wells. And I think that's an important place to start. Um, I was brought to this project during a time when I was serving as a proctor at Harvard. Um, and a proctor is just kind of a fancy name for a residential assistant. So I had been living with 18 year olds for four years as an adult. Um, so definitely some fun times there and also didn't get too much sleep. Um, but in this role, I was also studying to be a healer and um, had been doing community organizing and just really kind of got into proctoring because I was at the Divinity School and it was a great job to get to meet young people and have free housing. And I really felt like I was coming face to face with the epidemic of mental health, a lack of mental health care that these young people were facing. So I would have young people coming to me to just sit and have holy presence together of saying, I'm really struggling. I can't get out of bed in the morning. I have no one to talk to. I don't know myself. And so our prescription is to send them to mental health services. And what we were finding is that there weren't enough counselors and therapists on college campuses to really respond to these young people. And as someone at the Divinity School who identifies as a secular chaplain and healer, I was like, we need to help young people find practices and ways of just tapping into their own wisdom and their own capability to heal. And I'm just going back to what Tyler said of we heal us. Like people just sometimes need a little bit of extra love and a little bit of extra steering to say you have the answers within you to confront some of these things that you're um, dealing with. So I say all of that as um, kind of a background to some of the brain research that we've been using at our own deep wells to say, this isn't just nice to have, like, it's not just, um, you know, healing is great and sitting in circles is great, but there's actual brain research behind how this is impacting people's ability to withstand the structures of depression and anxiety. So we really like Dr. Lisa Miller, PhD, definitely recommend her book, The Awakened Brain, The New Science of Spirituality. And this is just a quote from her, but she says, for spiritually aware people across faith traditions and including those without a faith tradition, the brain appears able to protect itself from the longstanding neurological structures of depression. So we're really interested in that brain research that's showing that these practices and belonging to a spiritual or soulful community actually provides a buffering effect to anxiety and depression. So this is um, kind of that in a, in a quote by Dr. Miller. And while I love that we use research and we're so invested in this research, I think this goes back to something that Tyler was saying, but our ancestors have, have been teaching us this for a long time. Indigenous communities have been teaching us about the power of communal practices, of sitting in nature, of investing in one's soul life for a long time. So while we love the data and we love the research because that is important, I just have to shout out our ancestors and Indigenous communities who have really been at the forefront of teaching us to just belong well to each other. Um, so that's my note on, on different kinds of data that can exist. So going back to the slide that Alyssa presented on the real structural violence and structural injustice that is causing so many people to feel disconnected from themselves, we know and we believe that we have what the world needs. And this is a quote from our very own Dory Baker, who says that spiritual leaders from across traditions hold practices that can lessen anxiety and support communal healing in this age of isolation, polarization, and climate despair. But the access ramps to those practices are often severed due to the institutional mistrust and religious trauma. We might, might we engage in evocative, winsome healing practices carefully tethered to their cultures of origin, sharing among wisdom traditions for the benefit of the earth and its inhabitants. 
And so this really says it all. Like we know that there are so many faith traditions that have something to offer. And within each of us, there is a deep well of spiritual wisdom, of soul life, however you name it, um, that can be tapped into to really confront um, isolation, climate despair, all of these things that we face um, as a as a species. But it's also important to note that a lot of young people, I'm not as young as Alyssa, but I still consider myself to be kind of young. I'm looking at you, Tyler. Um, the access ramps are really severed and we know why. We know the history of institution of the institutional church, of organized religion. It has caused serious harm. And so we are not offering that solution to people, but we're saying, hey, we are a safe, inclusive space that really wants to help you access um, these life-saving practices and resources. And so I always love to have some visuals next to the we have what the world needs because these are just moments of deep joy and authentic human connection that have emerged since 2022. So we've been lucky enough to present at retreats and gathering spaces across the country um, from the East Coast of Virginia and Washington, D.C. And we're just getting ready to go to Lake Tahoe in a couple of weeks, but to really meet communities where they are and to say, we have some guiding resources to help you tap into your own soul life and into the soul life of your community. And it has just been so fun and so wonderful to see how people arrive to these spaces with heaviness, with confusion of how we're going to live on this planet, how we're going to take care of this planet, and then to leave these spaces feeling a little less lonely and a little more hopeful. So the, the definition of a soulful practice is um, kind of infinite, um, but a good working definition that, that we like to go to is any repeatable act or acts that can calm us and put a space in between our reaction um, or response to a triggering or harmful event and any act that can allow divine wisdom to lure us to a place and time each day where we reconnect to tap roots that anchor us and revitalize ourselves. Um, and it's important to note that it's not a soulful, I know what I'm doing, um, but something that you are actually putting into practice. And it's going to look different every time you sit down and do it. Um, and another thing that as a collective, we're really trying to emphasize is the importance of doing soulful practice in community. Um, it's still beneficial to do soulful practice alone. Um, but there's something super powerful about doing soulful practice in community with those who understand you and see you. And that's what that's what this collective is all about. Um, and as Anna was saying, we we have more retreats coming up and we've had plenty of things go on in the past and our list of soulful practices is constantly growing based on the research that we continue to find and also what we learn from our participants and what is working for them in their lives. So some examples of soulful practices that we reach to are those that reclaim time, those that focus appreciation towards spirit, self, or others, those that revere nature, icons, other humans, um, and just spirit, source, and those that theologic physiologically reset us, um, those that provide a deep dive into trusted space for heart-to-heart -heart reflection on meaning making. Um, we have the live to tell model of deep listening and the togetherness practice. And I've just included a few photos from these different soulful practices. You see the, the cups up there in the corner from a practice called May You Never Thirst, which is one of my favorite practices. Um, and then these two photos on the bottom are from those togetherness practice and live to tell models of really being able to enter into space with trusted people and and share share your heart with them. 
I'll just point out, Alyssa, we have a question in the chat, which I love. Please continue using the chat box. But this question comes from Cheryl, who says, would you explain moon seeking, the practice of moon seeking? So do you want to take that or do you want me to hop in? You can do that, Anna. You got it. Yes. Yeah, so the moon seeking practice is one that is written and sourced from one of our leadership team members named Eliza who um, is Jewish and has written this practice that really is about honoring time. So um, I can't quite remember the Hebrew term that's connected to the practice, but it's essentially talking about um, when her ancestors were freed, they realized that time again was theirs and that time belonged to them and that they could own this time in a really beautiful way. And so at every new moon, um, Eliza practices this new moon practice to say, how can I honor time? And like, how am I slowing down to really think about the cycle of the moon and where I sit within that cycle? And I know that Dory may have more info there if you wanna share more if I, or if I covered it, no worries. Oh yes, there it is. So that is one of the practices that she's written and that we now share with folks and we practice with folks and it will soon be available on our website. So if you're interested in any of these practices, that is where they will live and where you can source them and use them in your own context. Also, quick plug for Live to Tell. Um, there's going to be a live Live to Tell on Thursday at 3. Um, and the title of that is Hope Blossoms. So if that's something that you're interested in, in engaging that holy deep listening, that would be a wonderful session to come to. Um, just always looking to to plug plug our our colleagues and our trusted folks. Yeah, and before we jump into a soulful practice together, um, I think one just important note to talk about the kind of why or the who of the soulful practices is we're bringing these to people and non religious context. And I think that that's really important to know because I can imagine maybe if you're at this conference, um, you might be a little more comfortable with religion or spirituality, but what we're finding in college dorm rooms or with people who are, you know, hosting a company meeting or a staff meeting, there's kind of the like, okay, let's do a go around. Like what's your kind of surface level question. And everyone answers with the, with the same, not true answer. And this is a real invitation to pause and to say, let's go deeper. Like let's, let's engage in this vulnerable trust work together that can really help us um, do that deep dive into trusted relationship building. So that's just a little note on the, where we're taking this. It's not, it doesn't mean that we're not also aiming to go to places, religious institutions or places that are a bit more religious or spiritual, but we really wanna expand this um, to folks who may have not had opportunities to think about moon seeking or some of the practices that Alyssa named. So with that, we will, or actually I invite you to join me in engaging in a soulful practice together. So the name of the practice that I invite us into is called Growing Wellbeing. And this practice was inspired by Livy and Dory Baker. I think is just so amazing that we are able to um, get a lot of our artwork from Livy Baker, who is an artist based in Washington State right now. So I first just want to pause and invite you to look at this image for 30 seconds. Let's kick it in. And as you look at this image, I am going to center us in sharing this artist's statement that comes from the artist who created this piece, Levy. So clockwise, clockwise from the bottom right corner, you see the seed, the sprout, the bloom, the fruit, and the slice of ripe orange. The labyrinth, along with the sun and moon and creatures, support this journey as the seed emerges and transforms. Like other growing things, we too evolve. We evolve in a balance of light and dark, surrounded by a community of beings. 
the labyrinth reminds us that even when we cannot see it, growth unfolds when we allow ourselves to be lured by the divine wisdom within and around us. We may not know where we are in any given cycle or season, but this practice helps us welcome the conditions that lead to our well being. So that's a note from the artist on this labyrinth that she has created. So now I invite us to take a few deep breaths. So I like to do box breathing of breathing in for five seconds, holding for five seconds, and releasing for five seconds. I just invite you to continue breathing at your own comfortable pace. And as you engage in this slow, deep breathing, I want you to notice the seed in this image, the sprout in this image. We notice the bloom and the ripening fruit. And now focus on the orange slices. Now, now I want you to take a deep breath in and notice the sun and moon. And remember that all beings need both light and darkness to grow. And now I want you to take a deep breath and notice the labyrinth, which is a reminder of the divine presence that grounds us in gravity and holds us. Breathe in as you notice the creatures who represent our communities, visible and invisible. And as you mindfully and slowly take in this image, I invite you to identify an image that represents where you are today in your journey of well being. So within this picture, Finding a piece that represents where you are today. Are you feeling like a seed in warm, fertile soil? Or maybe you're feeling like a sprout reaching towards the light. But just notice what part of the picture calls out to you or makes you curious. Allow your imagination to linger there. And as you linger there, notice any memories that are surfacing or curiosities that might be arising. Perhaps you feel spirit's presence or perhaps you feel a spirit's absence, or maybe a little nudge. And now I invite us to take one more deep breath in and breathe out. And I'm gonna invite you, if you have a pen and paper like me, or maybe a note section on your laptop, to just spend about two minutes writing down what surfaced for you as you engaged in this well-being meditation, looking at this piece of art. So I will call us back at 424.
All right. I invite you to wrap up those thoughts and reflections and we'll come back in the large group. And I was gonna ask Alyssa to stop sharing, but I'm not gonna do that just in case there's complications coming up. But if you can scroll your screen over so that you see more people and less screen, that way we can just feel and pretend that we're all in a room together, that would be great. And um, I just wanna invite us, like feel free to please come off Zoom, imagine that we're sitting in a circle together. Um, and I'd love to know what surfaced for folks um, that the room might benefit from hearing. Yeah, Tyler. Yeah, I was just thinking about like you developed or honed in on these practices in response to social media overconsumption, social isolation, and climate despair, and how um, like what does it mean that stopping to breathe is resistance against social media? It means that social media is taking our breath away. So like, I, I feel like part of like centering in for me was also identifying the thing that I'm kind of pressing against that makes me need to remember to do that in the first place. And mm. that was kind of a new perspective for me. Mm, thank you for sharing that. It does take our breath away. Yeah. Oh. Did anyone else identify with a certain piece of the artwork? It's okay if you didn't too, but I'm curious if anyone was like, yes, I am the orange or like, I am the worm. Okay, I see Sophie. That's, I. it was actually the orange, which is also what you just said aloud. Um, but the interesting experience for me was I, I just kept being drawn to the orange and then feeling like, but that doesn't make sense. Like, I don't have an explanation for that. And then I thought, like as I was sitting and pausing, like I'm going to step back from trying to create a reason or explanation or um, purpose behind why I feel connected to that and just sit with it. And perhaps some deeper clarity will emerge and perhaps not. But um, rather than me trying to create an answer or put an answer on it, um, I just stepped back and delighted in like, I think I just, I really like the orange in this. I just, my, my eyes are drawn there. And so I'm going to sit with that and let that be enough. Mm -hmm. I'm going to sit with that and let that be enough. Thank you, Sophie. Yes, Cassidy. Yeah, Cassidy. Um, yeah, I had a similar experience, Sophie, where I was drawn to toward the moth, and I was like, "Hi, I don't, I'm not a moth." Um, but yeah, there was something about um, just letting myself sit in the uncertainty of of that moment of what's drawing me in. Um, and letting go, yeah, or even not just letting go, but resisting the need for quick explanations, uh, I think is an important part of what that practice invited. Um, so yeah, I mean, I maybe can think of some ideas and have thought of some ideas of why it was the moth that resonated. Um, but there's something generative in letting myself just follow what calls my attention. Mm, I wrote that down, resisting the need for quick explanations. Thank you for sharing that. And I think that that brings up, for when you said that, I was like, oh, wow, doing a presentation on why soulful practices matter feels like, like we have to explain it, like, you know, explain. And sometimes it's just like this feeling of like, I can't explain it, but it just something resonated with me or something feels good. And so I, I wrote that down because I 
sometimes I think in our world, we're expected to have a perfect explanation or the data behind it. And, and sometimes there's just not, it's just a connect connection to feeling. So I really appreciate you saying that. Um, and I'll just one more time, open the floor if anyone else wants to share a reflection from this practice. All right, well, I'll just say um, thank you to Dory and Livy for offering us this beautiful practice and this piece of art. But I think it's connection to the larger theme of this conference um, is that when I look at this picture, I am reminded of all the living species that exist beyond humans. And I am sure I haven't been able to attend as many talks as I wanted to this week. But one thing that um, one of my mentors, Terry, reminds me of is we're not just trying to confront climate change for us and our species, but we're doing it for the orange trees and for the butterflies and for the sun and for living creatures. And so I feel like this piece of artwork, if you were to print it and take it with you on a hike or we are, have a dream of putting it on bandanas to send to people, but like, how can you go outside and remember that we are not the only species here, even though many of our kind pretend that we are. Um, so that's just my last note on this practice. And thank you all so much for engaging in a soulful practice with me. Great. So that is one of our offerings. And I would love to know from this group, just based on what you've learned today about soulful practices, I am sure you all have your own definitions and practices but we're curious about what are the soulful practices that are helping you survive and thrive? So just, I invite you to put that in the chat box or come off mute and share with us um, any practices that you have that are helping you. Meditation from Maureen, welcoming prayer from Tyler. Mary says, time spent listening to music, particularly cloud cult. Making and creating. Oh, the artist way. Yes to morning pages, Sophie. So good. Coloring during corporate worship, letting myself show up the way I need to. I love that. Running, snuggling with my dog, deep breathing and centering prayer knowing I am eating the energy of the sun. Oh, that's beautiful language. Thank you everyone for sharing those. I'm like mental noting many of these. Cycling other people's dogs. I love the energy of beasts these days. Yes, story. Uh, but if no one has reminded you lately, the things that you just put here are so deeply important. They're as important as what you're eating, your jobs, your everything. Like these are sustaining practices that I hope you really just honor. And we write these down and we put them on really pretty cards. And if that's helpful to you, I just invite you to write those down and hold on to them as a sacred document that you can keep and pass down to your ancestors and your neighbors and your friends. But I appreciate that sharing. And now I'm gonna pass it over to Alyssa. So as we've as we've talked about a little bit today, um, we've we've had the opportunity to have these retreats and bring people together. Um, but I just want to do a little bit of a deeper dive with you guys to to tell you where we've been um, and and where we're going. We've done a lot and we're going to keep on doing a lot. Um, we're working on experimenting with virtual, in-person, and hybrid ways of engaging soulful practices, kind of like this one. Um, there's lots of soulful practices that can be done both ways, um, and some that are better in, in an in-person context. Um, but in our first year, we had our very first pilot retreat where we kind of prototyped the, the like, retreat curriculum to see how it looked. Um, and it was awesome. So we kept going with it um, and have had a couple other retreats since then. 
in, in different places across, across the country. And we've been doing these soul trust learning journeys to gather wisdom from those that are a part of our collective, most recently at Alohe. Um, and as Anna said, we're gonna be going to Lake Tahoe at the end of this month to continue, um, continue learning and to continue cultivating these practices with each other. And our next steps are just continuing to meet with folks through retreats and online um, spaces, which I'm about to plug an event that we have this Friday, but we're really also working on our resources. So um, similar to what Tyler was saying about his work, we are really just trying to listen to folks, asking the question, what do you need? How can we respond? And we've heard from people that they really like our resources and guides and like printable things that folks can take with them as they are leading in their own context. So we'll be developing some of those and encourage you to sign up for our newsletter so that you can receive those um, and that it might be helpful for the work that you're doing. Um, and I just wanted to be sure to invite you all to some summer circles that we'll be launching starting this Friday. And um, these are virtual communal healing spaces primarily for organizers and advocates, but we're also expanding that to anyone that just feels deeply impacted by the heaviness of what's happening in our world right now, be that the climate catastrophe, what's happening in Israel and Palestine, what's happening on our own southern border. These are not normal times, and so we know that together we grieve and together we heal. So I just invite you to take a picture of this. Um, you can scan the QR code to register but we'll be running three sessions starting this Friday, next Friday, and then one on Tuesday the 23rd, but all are invited. And finally, we just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for being here, for being interested um, in our work, for being interested in communal healing, and for being people that care about the planet and each other. So we want to stay in touch. We invite you to follow us on Instagram and LinkedIn at our own We also have a QR code here on the right hand side for our website. But the biggest ask that we have is if you could fill out our survey that will just ask you a couple of questions um, that would really help us as we continue to build our organization. So thank you all so much. And um, we will now open it up for any questions that you might have. Yeah, that I wanted to go in and say for sure. I know Anne already put the feedback thing up, but actually on the schedule, we have a whole extra 20 minutes to do Q&A. And I think, um, you know, obviously starting first with Anna and Alyssa, but, but if you want to pull in Tyler, and I don't know if Tyler, Anna and Alyssa, if you first want to say something to each other, that might be a good place to start. I really love that invitation, Mary, because I, Tyler, as I was listening to your presentation, I saw so many connecting points of yeah. the work that we're doing. And I was like, collab moment. Um, but also I just, the, the quote that I kept saying through our presentation that really came from you is this idea that we like, we got us and we heal us. And I think mm -hmm. for any people who are doing healing work or like creating projects around wanting to help people heal like that's the most foundational thing that we have to understand is that most of the time people know exactly what they need they just need the structural yeah. injustices to be moved to actually engage in that work of healing so I just thank you so much Tyler for that reminder and invitation to continue mm -hmm. like that's the foundation hmm yeah I think that that really came to the forefront at New City um, for two reasons. One, because of abolition work, especially following the uh, 2020 uprisings, just kind of realizing like community safety is, cannot be outsourced and uh, punishments don't make things better. And, uh, and therefore, like, we kind of have to take responsibility for community healing. This was, this is not new information for a lot of folks in the community and a lot of uh, folks who have been doing this work for decades. But I think that as an organization, the church started saying like, so what does it mean if we're actually, if this is it, if if we're we're what God gave us and this is it. Um, the other thing that I 
we talk a lot about, or I try to talk a lot about at New City is um, like the theology term, like we're creating kingdom conditions. So it's like, we're not, um, like we trust that all of creation has the inborn ability to heal itself. And our job is to create the conditions for those, for that healing to happen, um, which is a, a fun theology. One question I had for you though, as we're talking about practices, um, like it seems like a theme in a lot of the practices that you identified are like practices that help settle the nervous system and help like engage presence. Um, have you ever had folks ask you about or introduce like the other end of religious expression in terms of like charismatic practices or like high engagement or um, uh, high um, expression kind of practices or does it tend more towards like contemplative and meditation? Mm, that's such a good question. And yes, that has come up, especially as we're thinking about this retreat in two weeks. Um, in fact, the person mm. who asked about them is my sister who is a dancer <laughs> and a DJ and a surfer and a skateboarder. And I think her mind was like, I don't know if I can come to a three-day retreat if we're just going to be like contemplative and sitting. She was like, I want to like pop my throat chakra and like dance and twerk. And I was like, that's great. Like these are, so, so to answer your question is like, the beautiful part is we aren't just creating the practices. It's been so fun to like go to folks and mm -hmm. to say, what are some of the things you're doing to, mm -hmm nourish yourself mm. and so my sister saying yeah I love to twerk as a spiritual practice <laughs> it's like part of that one too so it's something that I think we're like trying to trying to like source more yeah amazing amazing um the other question I had was I mean Alyssa you were talking about um just graduating and like you know, uh, being in your friend groups and seeing kind of the impacts of those three things, social media, social isolation, and climate despair. Um, like, this is so open-ended, but like, in general, how do your, how are you, how do you and your friends relate to social media right now? Or like, how do you imagine the ways that you would, that is such a huge, hard question <laughs> but I, I just like any like do you feel like people are comfortable with the relationship that they have with social media does it feel consuming does it feel like yeah what is what is your perspective I think some people are maybe falsely comfortable with social media especially those that are in like like I'm Gen Z like old like older Gen Z where you know I I've been on Instagram, God, since I was probably in like second or third grade in some capacity, like the people that are, and I'm 22. So like 22 and right around there, like we've always kind of had that. And sometimes it feels like this extra appendage where there's an expectation that you have it. Um, and like, if you don't have it, then you're a social outcast um, mm. and it's weird. But I think for me personally, I, I have like my, my timers on, on my different apps and stuff, but I also, I was a journalism major in undergrad. And so I'm very, um, I try to be very attuned to like current events. And so that manifests itself in me following a lot of news outlets, which is extremely depressing when I like go onto Instagram or uh, Twitter and it's just like all of these really depressing news things. Um, yeah. yeah. So I think, I think the relationship with social media is very complicated, especially because there is an expectation that we are staying engaged with what the current events are, but then it becomes right. so hard because then they're just always there. And, and sometimes it's hard to, to get away from them. Um, but I think within my own friends and my own um, circle of people, I think there there may be a false comfortability with it. Like some people think that they wow. don't have a problem with their social media consumption. Yeah, yeah. That feels like a really critical observation. Um, 
two, well, two, two of that, my takeaways from what you're sharing. One that um, it, I think it's easy, especially in contemplative spaces to be like, oh, social media is the worst. Why doesn't everyone just get rid of it? And what I mean is like, there are real social and like professional consequences to not being on social media. So it's not yeah. just like have this or don't have this. Like there's real like ways that it disadvantages you in, in trying to make the world. And so like part of our response to that has to be things more like timers than like, yeah. And then the other thing that, really stuck out to me from what you're saying is like uh I don't know if the word is delusion but like some you have some people in your life that you're like I think that they're more comfortable with it than they should be so there's kind of this gap of like the perception of like how they perceive themselves relating to this and then how people on the outside see them relating to that and I feel like one of the ways that's um the, the soulful practices can help people as uh, one of the ways that the social, soulful practices blesses me is that it helps me bring those a little bit closer together where it's like, wait a second, I actually am problematically relating to this right now. And like mm -hmm. that kind of awakening is half mm -hmm. of half of the battle for, for me personally. Right. Mm -hmm. mm, I just wanted to uplift uh, Reverend Sierra's question here. Um, I, I really appreciate this. I can understand why this works for some populations of young people, such as young adults living on college campuses, um, but it feels far away from the populations of young adults who you work with. Um, they get really stressed out by contemplative practices and social, pra and social practices, but they also crave connection deeply. And I just first really appreciate that sharing that this uh, the practices we have developed right now, like, probably won't resonate with with many people. And I think it's important for us to continue to like, at, to, to meet people where they are at, because I think, like, I was in the shower this morning, um, as all great ideas come in the shower, but I was like, wow, my relationships feel still really far apart after COVID. Like, I don't know if other people feel that way, but it's like COVID happened and as a nation and as a world, we're kind of like, okay, and let's go back to like the, to the grind and life as usual. And my relationships and friendships feel tethered. And that's something that I've heard from a lot of young people too. Um, so people craving deep connection, I think is something we're experiencing on a global world. And so what would it look like to have practices that are a little more simple that are like how to maintain friendship practice, like how to reach out to people you love practice in a world that doesn't really teach us how to do those things or normalize that, yeah, relationships are different right now. Or being a gamer means that perhaps you like spend more time on a screen and less time engaging with people in real life. So I just really appreciate you uplifting that. And I think it's something that I'm chewing on too, as I think about us really building a diverse collective that can bring some of these ideas as we are trying to develop resources. Um, and I don't know if Dory or Tyler or um, Alyssa, you want to speak to that question. Um, well, yeah, I think um, I, I do want to name, at least from the Incarnation Fund perspective, that there's clearly a gender dynamic happening uh, with how we run our program. Like the, the Incarnation Fund is overwhelmingly female or femme. And like, um, so I, I think that, you know, at the uh, I'm forgetting the name of the person who asked the question, uh, Reverend Sierra talking about working with neurodivergent boys, 18 to 23, like, I'm curious about what the role of masculinity is in the midst of that and like how boys and men have, uh, how we have been socialized to relate to each other. Um, and I think that part of the reason why video games are so engrossing in part is because it creates a structured social, con it creates structured social contact with people without requiring the type of vulnerability that uh, like, Sometimes boys and men aren't always socialized to be able to have. So um, I'm speaking in huge generalizations, but I, I do think that um, 
one of the reckonings that we have in in the religious imagination in the in 2024 is how spiritual practices can find their way into a lot of different gender expressions of people in a lot of different communities. And I'm also curious, like how spiritual practices, soulful practices can inform the games that we're playing. Like right now I'm playing um, uh, Breath of the Wild. My husband got me onto Breath of the Wild, which is like this little game you're running around the world. And uh, there's very obvious intention to have moments where you're like running through nature and where your character is breathing. And I wonder if even, even that, simplicity of like just having moments of pause and breath and reflection for a video game character like wouldn't change some of the like internet strangeness that we're witnessing right now yes <laughs> of course reverend sierra i remember you hi sierra marie um, I see Cassidy um, is talking about fan fandom spaces as being like critically important to addressing so social isolation. And I love this question, like what can we learn from these spaces and how are they tapping into our own deep wells? So not to put anyone on the spot, but like if there's a reflection that comes from like, from that, like that, I would love to know from this group, you know, what can we learn from these spaces or like, what are the best parts we can source for them? I'd be curious to hear from you all. Okay, I can't help it. I'm gonna jump in here. Um, <laughs> there are some people who've done a lot of research on this that are really, it's really interesting and great research, right? And so you could look at Jane McGonigal's work, you could look at Henry Jenkins work, you could look at the civic participation and civic media work that's come out of the MIT press. There's a lot of really great stuff. And one of the, one of my frustrations lately is that um, uh, popular media have picked up on one element of Jonathan Haidt's latest book. And it's like panic everywhere, rather than looking at other empirical research. So I put a, a link into Ellen Weinstein and Al James's book, but um, some of us have been trying to say for decades now that there's stuff that can be learned from the ways in which people play games together that can be really helpful to the ways in which we think about religious formation. So yes, and... <laughs> Yeah, and I, I've actually been doing a lot of thinking about this um, as someone who very unexpectedly found myself in a, a fandom space within the last year. So spending time with with people who are fans of a particular piece of media um, and seeing how these spaces cultivate community um, and um, creativity. Um, but then also there's there's some campaigning going on in that as well for one of these shows where it's, it's trying to get the show picked back up because of a cancellation. And this has you know been going on for over a, a year now. And so thinking what do we what can we learn about um, building sustained community, sustained active community? Um, for all kinds of purposes um, from this this fandom community, from this place where we are are just having fun, you know, and because we're having fun together and we're building fun practices together, we are therefore sustained for a certain kind of of activism work in a way. Um, in ways that I don't necessarily see in other kinds of um, perhaps climate justice related things or, or even other kinds of um, faith communities and spiritual practices um, where there's a lot of advocacy being um, woven into that as well. So it just I've just been thinking a lot about that. Um, and um, it's helpful, Mary, to hear about those resources. And I, I want to look into that and think how, yeah, how do we, what can we glean from um, spaces where we might have, we've been overlooking perhaps um, a mm -hmm. lot of richness. 
I so appreciate you saying that, Cassidy. First, I'm like curious to check out all the fandom things now. Um, but just one point on what you said, I think that sometimes climate change spaces or even like healing contemplative spaces don't always focus on joy and play. And that's like something I feel excited about. Like I do a lot of climate change work. I did a lot of climate change work in div school. And like, it got to a point where I was like, I don't want to cry anymore. Like, I want to like talk about like books we're reading or like, how are we keeping ourselves sustained in this long game work? And so I just appreciate you lifting that up. Um, Cause as like a healing practitioner myself, I'm like, we need more time for play and like hobbies and like, I want to know about the weird fairy books that people are reading and all the things. So anyways, I think Dory, you might've come off mute. I did for a moment just to say, I'm so excited about where this conversation has gone because I think it takes us to a space we haven't been looking at in, in, our, in our work. And I'm so excited to, to have that new door open to be thinking about play and and gaming and and the kind of play that just takes you away and you look up hours later and you don't realize how much time spent doing it like that's that that's amazing that's what can sustain us when when linked you know if we kind of had a flashlight effect that reminded us that when we get out of ourselves we're connecting to something more um and i'm you know i'm excited to look at your resources mary and to connect up with um, some of the goodness that just comes in that beautiful capacity of the part of the earth that we are as humans to get carried away in play. I think it's very much like getting carried away in, I think it's the same muscle um, that happens when we get carried away in uh, ecstasy and delight and spirit. I think we're coming up close to our end. And so I think if there's another um, one last question and then maybe a chance for Tyler, Anna and Alyssa to offer any closing remarks. And I'm gonna remind Anne to put the Padlet link and the eval in the chat again, cause there's been a lot in the chat since those went in. Um, so is there one last comment or question before we give our speakers another chance? I'm not seeing anything. So um, Tyler, do you have anything else you want to offer by way of closing? And then I'll ask Anna and Alyssa. Sure. Um, so I'm at tylersit.com if any of you ever need to be in touch. Um, I, I want to, yeah, I want to conclude with something I wasn't planning on sharing, but um, uh, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk's uh, base assumption in The Body Keeps the Score, which I know many, many of you have read, is like the whole point uh, is that our body gives, when danger presents itself, our body gives us energy activation to be able to fight or flight or flee or do whatever we need to do to deal with that. And trauma is in part what happens when that activation doesn't effectively save us from a scary situation. And like trauma healing, then uh, it, like one phrase is effective, effective action is what trauma healing is about. Like how can our, when we feel activated, those feelings and that emotion and that energy can get us to a, a place of greater comfort or greater community or connection. And I think as we approach conversations about gaming and about play, like both of these, it can go really in both directions. Like in one way, play is an exercise of effective action. And, and also like sometimes fandom is some of the most toxic parts of the internet because there's an activation that doesn't correlate to like physical or somatic healing. And, and then we get like some pretty toxic thought pretty quick. So I feel like some of our task with these practices is like letting effective action guide our delight and our community to create safety. Okay, that's my last thought. The beautiful last thought. Anna, Alyssa? Either one of you have something you wanna share? Alyssa, you wanna, you wanna hop on? 
software. I just had to move move locations to plug my computer in. Um, but just thank you all for engaging with us and letting us tell you about the work that we do and also inspiring us to, to really dig into some new and different avenues that we haven't completely thought of yet. Um, I'm really excited for, for the potential of where this is going and yeah, yeah, this has been great. Thank you guys. Yeah, and I'll just echo with a lot of gratitude. Um, I just think it's so cool that I feel so connected to you all, even though I'm standing in my room at a standing desk alone um, in an apartment. But just thank you for your presence. Um, I think that presence is one of the deepest forms of love that people can give to each other. And I just encourage you to nurture the practices that are sustaining you and to do them with people that you care about.